If the day ends in Y and Donald Trump shows up for court, he's probably having a meltdown, folks. And yep, once again, Donald Trump had a meltdown when he appeared at the New York Attorney General civil fraud case that is currently now going to be in week five of trial. It was in week four of trial last week. And Michael Cohen concluded his testimony. Then Donald Trump banged the table. He stormed out and his son Eric tried to console him earlier that day. Donald Trump was found also to be in violation of the gag order that was imposed on him again, and the judge issued this time a $10,000 contempt sanction. Now that Michael Cohen has finished his testimony, next up, folks, are the Trump fraud spawn, Eric Don Jr. and Ivanka. Well, Ivanka tried to escape her testimony, but the judge rejected those efforts. She may still file an appeal, but we will keep you posted. And then after the Trump spawn testify, Donald Trump is scheduled to testify November 6th. All of this shows how supremely confident New York Attorney General Letitia James is in this prosecution. We will break it all down. A lot to break down there, Popak. Then we go to Colorado where Donald Trump was hit with an avalanche of bad news. The petition to disqualify him from the ballot that was filed in early September under the Constitution's 14th Amendment Section 3 Disqualification Clause prohibiting insurrectionists from running for office. Yep, that petition will now be heading to a trial on the petition on Monday, October 30th. The court rejected Trump's motions to dismiss. I should say his many motions to dismiss on procedural, substantive, constitutional, statutory grounds. And the Colorado Supreme Court rejected Trump's emergency petition for a stay to try to block the trial from taking place. So folks, get ready for another trial, which by the way, that was not originally on Popak's board of trials this summer. We next go to Washington, D.C., which was on Popak's board of trials because that trial scheduled for March of 2024 in D.C. That's the federal case against Donald Trump for his attempt to overthrow the 2020 election. And this case continues to heat up. Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, as we predicted here on Legal AF when the indictment was unsealed, has indeed taken an immunity deal and from all reporting is prepared to testify against Donald Trump at the March 2024 trial. Also, the federal judge presiding over the case, Judge Chutkin, brilliantly has put Donald Trump on the spot with all of Trump's braggadociousness that he wants to see this case be televised. He wants it out in public. So Judge Chutkin very intelligently, very surgically put out an order asking Donald Trump's lawyers if he would like the trial test televised. Yes or no. Meanwhile, Donald Trump filed four motions to dismiss, each more frivolous than the next. Also, Trump tries to blackmail, or what's often referred to as gray mail when it comes to classified documents, the United States government. And special counsel Jack Smith, in a motion on the discovery that's been produced, tells Judge Chutkin just how frivolous Donald Trump's discovery motions have been. And Jack Smith says, perhaps if Donald Trump's lawyers just called us, we would have explained to them that those documents they're complaining about were produced many, many months ago. We would have showed them where it was. In fact, we put it in alphabetical order for them. We tried to dummy proof it for them, but I guess he can dummy proof for dummies sometimes. And finally, we go to Georgia. Speaking about dummy proof and dummies, Jenna Ellis, another Trump lawyer and co-defendant in the Georgia criminal RICO case, has pled guilty. That makes four guilty pleas. Three Trump lawyers have now pled guilty in the Georgia RICO case. Also, Judge McAfee, the judge presiding over the case, 
kind of was trolling Donald Trump as well, set a hearing date on Trump's motions to dismiss where Trump incorporated by reference the arguments of the individuals who now pled guilty. And so the judge is like, okay, let's hear let's hear those motions, by the way. We'll, 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 we'll take a look at those. Also, Trump continues to file more frivolous things in that case. We will break it all down here on Legal AF. I'm Ben Micellis, joined by Michael Popak. Things are really, really heating up as we start getting into the heart of this trial schedule and new trials like the Colorado one are being added. And we may see that now take place all across the country, Michael Bopak. Yeah. The famous composer, John Larson, before he wrote Rent, wrote an autobiographical musical play called Tick, 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 Boom. And that's my new repurposing for the next week or so in the upcoming civil fraud case with Don Jr., Eric, Ivanka, and then boom, Donald Trump. And that order was chosen on purpose by a Cheshire cat grinning Letitia James in the courtroom. She knows exactly what she obtained by watching Donald Trump react and overreact to Michael Cohen. And now she's ready to go in for the kill, first having the children go first, and then Donald Trump. All of that, and Trump can't get straight what cases he wants to appear in and what cases he doesn't. And there seems to make no logical sense. He shows up occasionally in New York for the civil fraud case, and he picks and chooses his moments there. I assume when the kids take the stand, he'll be present. Who the heck knows? Um, But for the case that you talked about, this one that has now gotten front and center starts a trial on Monday about whether he is an insurrectionist or not for the purposes of the 14th Amendment in Colorado, a bench trial. Apparently, he's not showing up at all, and his lawyers are going to be phoning it in with argument without any evidence, really, to argue um, properly in front of the judge. This um, Donald Trump and his team variously seem to be allergic to evidence and presenting it properly in court, and they get nailed for it by real judges uh, wearing black robes over and over again. You know, it's why I'm so excited to discuss later in this episode this motion that was filed by special counsel Jack Smith, because it's a perfect example where the Trump conspiracies that are injected through the disinformation propaganda chambers meet the courtroom where Donald Trump and his lawyers try to act like Fox propagandists in court and say something like the January 6th committee has destroyed all of its records. I mean, first off, it's all available online. You could basically Google it. It was the Republicans who shut down the January 6th committee's uh, official website. So it all had to be archived and archived it was. There's also some sensitive documents that are not part of the publicly available available archive that were all turned over months ago by special counsel Jack Smith. So when Donald Trump's lawyers file such a frivolous motion like that and make this accusation that the January 6th committee destroyed all of the records and therefore Donald Trump should win the case, special counsel Jack Smith says, here's where it was turned over. We put it in alphabetical order. What are they talking about? They have these records, millions of them. We'll talk about that and more, but Let's talk about the Trump meltdown. You talk about tick, tick, boom. Donald Trump was sitting there. Michael Cohen was testifying. You've got Donald Trump's uh, uh, co-defendants lawyer, this guy uh, Cliff Roberts, makes a directed verdict, a motion to dismiss after Michael Cohen's testimony because Michael Cohen admitted to things that we all knew that Michael Cohen would admit to, which makes no sense at all that that's why Trump's lawyers thought that this was a big Perry Mason moment, and Donald Trump keeps using that term. It was a Perry Mason moment. You can't even bring directed verdicts until after the evidence comes in and the plaintiff's case has rested. So there's no such thing as filing an oral directed verdict motion after a witness. But Trump's co-defendant's lawyer makes this motion, motion to dismiss, judge. And the judge is like, what are you talking about? Denied. And then Donald Trump... (laughs) bangs the table, runs out. So Popak, tell us what went down there. 
Tell us about the sanctions, the contempt sanctions that were issued against Donald Trump earlier that day for further attacking Judge Ngoron's law clerk. And then Donald Trump was put on the witness stand. And then, of course, you alluded it to at the outset, the tick, tick, boom of all of the Trump adult spawn testifying next did week. You, did you hear my little inadvertent evil laugh before you gave it to me? I was like, <laughs> like, I can't wait for this. All right. First of all, let me lead it in this way. It's not the thing. It's the thing behind the thing. Now, let me explain it. It's not the directed verdict that they improvidently made at the end in some grand theatrical gesture to show that Michael Cohen actually helped the defense, as you said in this ridiculous Perry Mason moment. It's not the thing, it's the thing behind the thing. It's what the judge said after they made the directed verdict motion and he denied it, that should send chills down the defense's spine. It's not the gag order that he violated or the $10,000 amount it's that he was forced Donald Trump to be put on the stand and the judge concluded after hearing him that he can't be trusted as a witness, that he says things that are untrue. And since he's the trier of fact for all evidence in the case, that's a devastating place to be. So not the thing, but the thing behind the thing to, to use a New Yorkism. Let's start with the mastery of Letitia James. We can't compliment her enough. Sometimes I even underestimate her, even though I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. And as a, as a trial lawyer myself, I can't help but, but um, uh, give her kudos when I understand after a bit what she's trying to accomplish with her team of 10 different um, uh, New York attorney generals, each taking turns at whacking this pinata, which is the Trump organization and Donald Trump until it breaks wide open and he loses his buildings, his money and his business reputation as some master titan of the New York business world. And it's coming and it's coming faster than we thought. We thought this trial would extend until December. At the rate it's going, it's going to be probably it could be a pre Thanksgiving where the judge gets the uh, the complete case handed over to him to make his ultimate decision. The mastery of Letitia James's group on display is how they used Michael Cohen. I don't think it was Michael Cohen for Michael Cohen's sake. In other words, it wasn't like we need this one bit of testimony in order to make our case because they don't. Even if there was poof, no Michael Cohen for various reasons, they've already put on enough evidence to win their case almost right now between the inside employees that are still there, like the assistant controller and the assistant vice president, the, the uh, disgraced former chief financial officer and, and chief controller who reported to that financial officer, the outside appraiser, the outside auditor. They don't need Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen right now, frankly, is just repeating and uh, things that have already been said by other witnesses that don't have some of Michael Cohen's credibility concerns. So why Michael Cohen and why now? Now I know why. He is the bait that Donald Trump would take so that Letitia James could see how Donald Trump would perform, overreact, and become unhinged, pushing his buttons so she could see it before he was called to the stand. She wanted to dis... Uh, she wanted to, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, not disable, but de destabilize Donald Trump mentally, which she's done. We've never seen so much acting out than we've seen Donald Trump do while Michael Cohen was about to go on the stand, on the stand, repeating the, you know, coming back to the stand. His outbursts, Donald Trump's in the courtroom, in the outside, talking to the fawning right-wing media that's throwing him softballs and calling him, you know, President Trump, President Trump, all of that. And then her just watching at the end, at the end of the day, talking about it with her lawyers. What do you think? Do you think now's the time? Do you think you think now's the time to put him on the stand? I think now's the time, don't you? Because they want him as destabilized and undisciplined as possible. There she is right there. Look at her. Look at her. That that is that signals supreme confidence and mastery in everything that's going on in that room. And now, now that he's oh he's um completely melted down, Donald Trump watching just Cohen testify and misinterpreting everything about Cohen. Cohen said that he was not given a direct order by Donald Trump to change the numbers on the financial statements to inflate them, but that he was given indirect 
mob-like instructions that was left clear to him what he was supposed to do. And of course, he testified, Alan Weisselberg told him, that the boss told him that he's supposed to change the books. And they jumped up like that was some aha moment. Aha! There's no direct. Listen to the complete testimony by Michael Cohen, corroborated by at least half a dozen other people who are not named Michael Cohen. I don't think, again, that the Michael Cohen event was meant necessarily to get the evidence in. It was meant to test Donald Trump, destabilize him with his children's testimony one at a time. I mean, it, Eric Trump has no nails left on his fingers before he's going to testify next week. And and then Ivanka, the prized Ivanka, the first daughter, the one that Donald Trump loves the most of all of his children, she's going to now be forced to testify against him about everything. And, and here's the thing about Ivanka. And then I want to make one last comment about Judge Engoron. Ivanka is unplugged. Why? Because they made a decision at the New York Attorney General's office not to depose her, meaning not to get her testimony out on the record in advance. She was interviewed, but she was not deposed, meaning Ivanka's lawyers, Bennett Moskowitz, has no idea where the New York Attorney General is going to go during direct examination, where hostile direct examination of her, because th there was never a dress rehearsal for it. So they have to now shadow box and guess but you know who knows where they're going with the case? The New York Attorney General. They know all the documents. They know all the evidence. There's no way they can get Ivanka prepared properly for that particular testimony before she has to give it, just like they can't prepare Donald Trump because he's incapable of being prepared. And the thing, finally, Ben, that is most devastating to their case is they got a window into the thinking of Judge Engeron early. They said point blank uh, when he said, first of all, I added the directed verdict motion, sit down. <laughs> Second of all, I don't see Michael Cohen as the critical witness that you do. There is, and he used his hands to gesture in the room, there is a mountain of evidence that could fill this courtroom about the issues of fraud brought by the New York Attorney General. So no, directed verdict denied. But it wasn't the denial of directed verdict. It was his comment about where his head is at, at the four-week mark in the trial. And that is a devastating result so far for Donald Trump. He might be telling his friends and family and followers that things are going great, but I'm here with you and Karen to say they are not. It has been a powerful blow to his case the last four weeks, and she's not done. She's got another week or two left before she even gives Donald Trump the case back. It's not even a thing to bring a directed verdict motion after a witness, uh, you know, even if you say that Michael Cohen was an important witness, that's not a thing that takes place at trial. That's not part of the civil procedure, it's not part of the rules. If you want to bring your directed verdict motion, you would bring that motion after the plaintiff finishes putting on their case in chief before the defendant puts on their case. You would say, Your Honor, there's been no evidence of liability here. We want a directed verdict motion. So that's at least the timing of when it would take place. So can the I, fact can that I say you one thing and then you can respond to it? I know what they did on the procedure. They were trying to argue it was almost a sanction for perjury by Michael Cohen, and they were entitled at that moment to directed verdict. You're totally right about you, normally when you and I move for directed verdict or have to oppose it, it's after the case in chief rest. But that was more of a, aha, Michael Cohen lied, he perjured himself, directed verdict in our favor as almost like a sanction. That's why it came. It doesn't change, I don't think, anything about your analysis, but that's why they did it. Well, and even if you look at the summary judgment motion that was brought by New York Attorney General Letitia James, it almost didn't rely on all on anything that Michael Cohen said. What it relied upon, the summary judgment motion that's already been granted, folks, because Donald Trump's already lost this case. The judge has already found Donald Trump, the Trump organization, and the Trump adult spawn other than Ivanka, Don Jr., and Eric. The courts already found them to be liable. And what New York Attorney General Letitia James had to rely on there was not the disputed evidence, because that's not what a summary judgment is. Summary judgment is undisputed evidence. So New York Attorney General Letitia James says, you don't even have to listen to our witnesses, Judge. 
Listen to their witnesses. Listen to their experts. Look at the undisputed facts where they said on their statement of financial conditions that Trump's triplex is 10,000 square feet, or rather they said it's 30,000 square feet when it's actually 10,000 square feet. Look at the golf course that's zoned for this and look that they then claim they can do this with it. Look at the valuation that Trump gave about Mar-a-Lago when he wanted to pay less property taxes. Here's what it's put. Here's what they put on the statement of financial condition. Let's go through all of these properties and let's just look at the Trump documents, the Trump appraisals. And that's what you should base your summary judgment on, not what Michael Cohen has to say or any of our state witnesses. So I want to make that point clear as well, which makes the directed verdict motion after you've already lost on liability equally frivolous because this is really just about disgorgement right now, well, damages, and well, one thing, further one thing. injunctive relief that would ban the Trump organization from yeah. doing doing business. Yep. One one thing, though, there, there is there is six counts left that have intent as the component. He won on uh, the New York Attorney General won in their fraud on the count that doesn't persistent fraud stand alone under New York law that doesn't require intent. Um, here, it's not just about disgorgement. It's about disgorgement plus the six counts of persistent fraud, business record fraud, financial statement fraud, insurance fraud that require intent, not at the level of criminal intent, but a but an intentional conduct. Uh, weirdly, strangely, New York law allows persistent fraud to be proven without even it. You could accidentally commit persistent fraud is what I'm trying to say. And yeah. that uh, right. And so that, so th just to be clear, I don't, I don't want to leave the misimpressions only about disgorgement and what are we doing? No, here. no. Well, that's why I also yeah, said sure. it was about disgorgement and the injunctive relief that then mm -hmm. relates to, you know, the, the, the other claims, but yes. And then they're already been found liable for the main fraud claim, which shuts down the Trump organization. That appeal is stayed pending the resolution of this trial. Ivanka right. Trump tried to avoid um, having to testify by claiming that she's not a New York resident. She tried to claim that she lives in Florida now. And so therefore, they're, unlike a criminal case where there is a uh, comity, C-O-M-I-T-Y, in a kind of interstate subpoena statute that allows a you all remember probably our reporting, for example, in Fulton County, right? When Fulton County District Attorney Phony Willis in a criminal case wants to subpoena somebody out of state legal AFers, you know the process, right? First, Phony Willis has to go to the Georgia judge, the Fulton County judge, then get an order there. Then you have to take that order into another state where the person lives and then get an order compelling them from the court in the jurisdiction where the witness you want to bring to Georgia lives. That exists in criminal, but civil, if you don't have jurisdiction, there is no statute like that. So one way to try to wiggle out of appearing at a civil case is basically saying, I don't live in the state. The state court doesn't have jurisdiction over me. And that's what uh, Ivanka tried to argue. By the way, Popak, Ivanka also tried to argue what I, what I was saying, um, which was like, hey, your honor, this case is just about damages right now. So why do you need me? I'm out of the case right now. I'm not a defendant. The Court of Appeals dismissed me. It's just about damages against my brothers and my dad. You just need them. You don't need me. And New York Attorney General Letitia James responded and said, whoa, 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 you get a lot of benefits from the Trump Organization. We know about those millions of dollars in distributions from the sale of the old post office in Washington, D.C. We know that they're paying your credit card bills and they're paying for your apartment. The Trump Organization, pays for your lifestyle, you're still affiliated with the Trump organization right now. So you don't get to say, I have no relationship with this New York Trump organization. You do. That's what the judge relied on. I would expect Ivanka to file an appeal and that we will do a hot take on that and she'll file some emergency motion to stay that. And we will talk about that when that goes down. I also want to talk about this contempt sanction before moving on to Colorado's disqualification case and this contempt sanction as well. Let's not forget that the Midas Touch editor-in-chief Ron Filipkowski was the one to originally break the story about Donald Trump violating the gag order on October 20th. The gag order was imposed on Trump on October 
October 3rd. And we broke the story on MidasTouch.com that Donald Trump had kept up the threats about the judge's law clerk um, and that Donald Trump didn't remove it from Donald Trump's website. So hat tip to Ron Filipkowski, because when Donald Trump was sanctioned that second time or the first time, whatever you want to call the October 20th gag order violation sanction, the judge has been escalating these sanctions ever since. Donald Trump was called on the witness stand. I want to talk just briefly about that before moving on to the Colorado disqualification uh, trial. But yeah, hat tip to Ron Filipkowski. And then Don Jr. and Donald Trump attacked us at Midas Touch. So if you want to know if impact is happening, when they start attacking you and when you're breaking stories like that on a fairly routine basis, that's why if you're able to support the growth of MidasTouch.com and its editorial team. We don't have outside investors. Go to Patreon.com slash MidasTouch, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash MidasTouch. We've got a lot to discuss on Legal AF. Let's take our first quick break of the day. Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I was tired of taking so many supplements and I wanted a single solution that supports my entire body and covers my nutritional basis every day. I wanted better gut health, a boost in energy, immune system support, and wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. I drink AG in the morning to start my day. It makes me feel unstoppable and ready to take on anything. And on top of it all, I'm doing something good for my body. I'm giving my body the nutrition it craves, and I'm covering my nutritional basis. I've tried a ton of different supplements out there, but this is different, and the ingredients are super high quality. I got started with AG1 because I used to take all these different pills and gummies, who knows what, and frankly, what I was taking was expensive, and I didn't even know if it was good for me. But with AG1, I know what I'm consuming has the best ingredients and also tastes delicious. AG1 makes it easier for you to take the highest quality supplements, period. When I started my AG1 journey, very quickly I noticed that it helps me with improved digestion, energy, and overall, I just feel great. It's just one scoop of powder mixed with water, once a day, making it a seamless and easy daily habit to maintain. I'm asked all the time about the one thing I'd do to take care of my health if I could only pick one. It'd be foundational nutrition, and AG1 is a top foundational nutrition product. Just one daily serving gives me the comprehensive foundational nutrition I need and supports energy, focus, strength, and clarity with 75 high-quality vitamins, probiotics, and whole food-sourced ingredients. I can't think of another daily routine that pays off as well as AG1, which is why I trust the product so much. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash legal AF. That's drinkag1.com slash legal AF. Check it out. Weight management can be a very personal and difficult journey. What works for some may not work for others. Everyone's healthy weight is different. And we all know that losing weight and maintaining it can be a challenge. And it's often hard to find the solution that's right for you. You've probably heard about semaglutide, and you probably have questions. Do you qualify? Is it too expensive? Will your insurance not cover it? There is a solution, Henry Meds. Henry Meds offers affordable online weight management programs that utilize compounded semaglutide. Compounded semaglutide has been used by doctors to help people lose weight and effectively keep it off. Unlike traditional weight loss medications, it is a non-stimulant and usable by more people. With Henry Meds, you just sign up online, speak to a licensed medical provider on the Henry Meds platform, and if you're qualified for treatment, you'll receive medication right to your door. No insurance needed. You'll receive compounded semaglutide at an affordable price, saving thousands with Henry Meds weight management program. If you've wanted to try the popular weight loss medications out there, but your insurance won't cover it, or it seems too expensive, try something new with Henry Meds. We've got a special offer for our audience. Visit henrymeds.com slash legalaf and receive $50 off your first month by using promo code 
Legal AF. Henry Meds offers prescription weight loss medication that reduces your appetite and cravings. And the monthly cost includes the telehealth provider appointment and medication. No insurance required. Again, that's henrymeds.com slash legal AF and receive $50 off your first month by using promo code legal AF. And we thank Henry Meds for sponsoring this content. Welcome back. We are live on Legal AF. We should mention as well that Donald Trump was compelled to take the stand during the New York Attorney General civil fraud case after he went out in the hallway during a morning recess and once again attacked the judge's law clerk who he repeatedly attacked over and over again. That's why a gag order had to be imposed on him. Judge and Gorans even said, look, you want to attack me? That's fine. My staff, I draw the line. By the way, I don't think it's fine that Donald Trump attacks judges. If this was any other litigant, Donald Trump would be uh, imprisoned for this conduct and he would have far more serious sanctions than $10,000. But I I did want to touch just briefly upon it because we know Trump's going to be testifying November 6th. The Trump kids are going to be testifying. The adult kids, by the way, that's how in all of the discovery the people in the Trump organization referred to Eric Don Jr. and Ivanka as the Trump kids, they're going to be testifying Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week. Um, but, you know, Donald Trump took the stand and he lied in that very short period of time. He performed like just miserably. Right. He said that he was talking about Michael Cohen not the judge's clerk. And the judge says, as the trier of fact, I find that Donald Trump's a liar. He's a liar. When he refers to Michael Cohen, he refers to Michael Cohen a certain way. When he attacks my law clerk, this is how he says it. And when I thought the important line in the judge's written order is the judge basically says, it is not appropriate, it is not okay, it is not acceptable to try to take advantage of the ambiguity in language while making clear attacks on people that can result in people getting killed or seriously harmed. And I find that Donald Trump is a liar. And also mentioned the Midas Touch report, where we identified that Donald Trump uh, had violated the gag order back on October twentieth. Uh, Popak, what did you think about Trump's brief testimony? I, I am very skeptical that Trump is going to show up for his testimony. I know he's compelled to. He doesn't have the ability to invoke the fifth because <laughs> he, he previously waived the fifth. But that doesn't mean he still will, may try to do it. I, I think he's right. too cowardly to testify. All right. You threw that hot potato in my lap. Let me, let, me, let me start with that one. First, I want to go back to something you and I talked about just briefly. Just to show you that this could all be about damages and disgorgement. And the case is really over. As I said on a hot take, this is weekend at Bernie's. This body is dead. Donald Trump is weekend at Donnie's. They can put makeup on him and glasses and a hat and carry him around for the next three or four weeks. But there's no doubt in my mind that Judge Angoron coming off of summary judgment and the findings that he already made on the pile and mountain of evidence he continues to refer to has already made up his mind about it. And this is just, you know, as soon as everybody shuts up and gets all the evidence in that they want, he's ready to rule. And his, he's already made a determination on credibility, as you just pointed out, on Donald Trump, which is the first time in, I don't know, I think it's either ever or it's in the last dozen years that Donald Trump in a courtroom has had to testify. And that was not something they, they didn't wake up that morning brushing their teeth on the defense going, hey, today's a good day to have Donald Trump without a script, without being coached or prepped, be forced by the judge under oath to say something. That's not how they started, I assure you. Even though they've made it their strategy and their tactics, the the, the trial within a trial is ridiculous, which is attack the justice system, attack Judge Angoron, and for good measure, attack his principal law clerk who sits alongside him on the bench and handles a lot of the day-to-day activities in a courtroom, much like a magistrate judge in federal court. They think this is a good strategy. The day that he violated the gag order, Donald Trump, is the same day that Alina Haba started the trial day before the trial day started by a point of order arguing to the judge that she didn't take she didn't like the fact the principal law clerk was rolling her eyes and and looks like she wasn't believing anything that Alina Haba was saying. No surprise there. And she said it wasn't fair and it wasn't nice and she was not playing by the rules. They started the morning 
And Alina Haba doesn't do anything unless Donald Trump approves it. And there on her checklist, on her clipboard, Alina Haba had number one, attack the law clerk again. That was morning. First break, Donald Trump with that strategy in his head, attack the law clerk. Attacks the law clerk, despite the gag order being in place, testing the judge again. What he didn't anticipate is that the judge would put him on the stand. Now, the judge, I don't know if you you remember this, Ben, but for our audience, when they, he granted the summary judgment and they got into court the next week to talk about what the shape of the trial would look like, him having already granted the summary judgment, and Chris Kais asking the question, the judge actually turned to the New York Attorney General staff and said, why don't you dismiss all the other counts and I'll go right to disgorgement and all your remedies? And they said, no, judge, we think we have to put on all the evidence through the other counts in order for, in order for us to be entitled to all this five or six pieces of remedy that we're looking for, including disgorgement and cancellation of the business certificates and removing Donald Trump as a trustee of his own trust and all this other stuff. And the judge is like, Okay. But his first inclination was, I've heard enough. I'm ready to go to remedy and sanctions. And now you've got a judge who is the only trier of fact. There is no jury who's concluded that Donald Trump, at least on one major issue, is a a liar. As he said, what he said was untrue. That's called a lie, a lie under oath to a judge. And so what it should have been, if you're Donald Trump and you're kind of picturing your best trial day with Michael Cohen testifying, what should have been about Michael Cohen's credibility as a witness became about Donald Trump's credibility as a witness, okay? Talk about sucking the oxygen out of the room in the wrong direction in your case. So what could have been the, you know a little bit of a highlight, oh, they cross-examined Michael Cohen on bias, something we've all known. You just have to listen to Michael Cohen. You know his background. I could do Michael Cohen for Michael Cohen. That's not the point. But it should have been about his credibility. And then in Lena Habas, cross-examiners are always taught you end on a high. You find the ending point in your cross-examination. That's something where you've scored a point and you sit down. But that's not what happened. What happened is it became all about Donald Trump in a bad way. And now Letitia James gave, she gave the order. Get them on the stand now. Get the kids first. Line them up one at a time. Show him what we're going to do to the kids and then bring Donald Trump on and end with Ivanka and then bring in Donald Trump. It's almost exactly been what we saw the Gen 6 committee do with uh, with the way they presented. They wanted to hit him in the heart with Ivanka and her testimony against him because because they know that solar plexus hit will have an impact on Donald Trump. He will be a destabilized, unhinged Donald Trump when he finally testifies. And as to your question, you don't think he shows up? Uh, Does anybody doubt that Letitia James and this judge will send the marshal? Uh, to to Trump Tower or to wherever to br- or call Secret Service to bring him in. He has no choice. Once subpoenaed, he has no choice. He will face jail. I don't think, even though he likes to call himself the Nelson Mandela of this situation, I don't think he wants to actually go to jail because he didn't show up at his at a civil fraud trial. I think, as part of my thesis, my prediction <laughs> that he's not going to show. I also include in there him trying to pull something or saying, well, now with all of these other federal cases that are going to trial, I now have to invoke the fifth. You can rely on my deposition testimony. Just he's a coward. I've studied his pathology over and over again. That's what no one's predicting this. And and I could just be totally wrong here, but his pathology is that of the biggest coward. And to spend two to three days on the stand being grilled and cross-examined and being shown just what a crook he is and also that he's not smart it will be it will be something interesting we'll all watch and you could put in your comments below what your prediction is let's talk about what our predictions are in colorado because these disqualification cases under the 14th amendment section 3 the disqualification clause they're heating up You may recall back in early September, a group that uh, is a friend of the show here at the Midas Touch Network, we've had their general counsel as well as their executive director on our various shows. The group's called Crew, 
Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. The acronym is CRU. They're the ones who brought this petition. They have a track record of being successful in bringing these types of uh, petitions uh, before. And the plaintiffs, the petitioners in this case, if you will, are actually a group of mostly former Republicans or kind of non-MAGA Republicans, which we highlight a lot here on the Midas Touch Network, that MAGA is not the Republican Party. They've taken over the Republican Party, but it's a group of actual Republicans and prominent ones who basically say that, no, this, what happened on January 6th was a coup. It was an attempt to overthrow our democracy. It's an insurrection. Donald Trump needs to be disqualified. Just so everybody remembers what Section 3 of the 14th Amendment states, it says the following, No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each house, remove such disability. One of the arguments, if you even want to call it that, that Donald Trump made, which is actually a bit of a kind of chilling argument, is Trump argued that as a president, he did not take an oath to support the United States Constitution. I just want you to think about that for a moment. This is from Donald Trump's motion to dismiss brief. Um, He filed multiple motions to dismiss, uh, but this is one that refers to the other brief where it says, the motion to dismiss explains, this is from Trump, this isn't from me, this isn't from the petitioners, this is from Trump what I'm about to read. The motion to dismiss explains why the President of the United States is not an officer of the United States. And Trump's reply in support of that motion will explain why petitioners' arguments to the contrary fail. The September 29th motion to dismiss also explains how Section 3 does not apply to all officers of the United States, but only those who take an oath to support the Constitution of the United States. As explained there, the presidential oath, which the framers of the 14th Amendment surely surely knew, requires the president to swear to preserve, to protect, and defend the Constitution, but not to support the Constitution. So Donald Trump's, one of his arguments is that the 14th Amendment Section 3 doesn't apply to him because he never took an oath to support the Constitution That should be chilling. That's what they actually are. That's why we go through the legal briefs, not the propaganda, the legal briefs. That's what Trump said. Trump also argued that this involved a political question doctrine so that it was non-judiciable, so that the judge shouldn't be able to rule. And then Donald Trump also argued that the 14th Amendment, Section 3, was not self-executing and it requires a decision by Congress to exclude Donald Trump and not by a judge like the Colorado judge presiding over this case, Judge Sarah B. Wallace. Donald Trump also tried to file a bunch of other motions on procedural grounds, statutory grounds. He filed an anti-slap motion saying that he had a First Amendment right to, I guess, lead an insurrection and that by invoking the 14th Amendment that chills his First Amendment speech, Judge Wallace rejected all of those arguments, said, look, if you want to make these arguments at trial or in post-trial briefing, go for it. But this case is headed for trial on Monday, October 30th. The petitioners are going to put forward a lot of witnesses, and we don't know who all these witnesses are going to be, but I think there's going to be some powerful witnesses because I've seen some of these motions in Lemonade Popak where even some of the witness names are for now being redacted. So it'll be curious to see who the petitioners call as well in their case in chief. To your point earlier in the show, Trump's 
I think not going to call any witnesses and just try to make the legal arguments about what, you know, the ones that have already failed, but try to make those to the Colorado Supreme Court. You know, and ultimately, I think these disqualification cases go to the United States Supreme Court on an expedited basis, and they'll all kind of get consolidated. Um, and, and the United States Supreme Court will probably be the have the final say in it. You know, one of the interesting things here too that uh, the court found in its order is, you know, look, this is the Colorado Secretary of State. Colorado Secretary of State is required to require to, compel to remove people who don't satisfy the constitutional requirements. The same way if someone was not born in the United States, the same way if someone doesn't satisfy other, you know, requirements, you know, that's what the Secretary of State's job is under Colorado law. So even setting aside the a declaratory relief type framing of a lawsuit under just constitutional grounds, what the court was saying too is this is a Colorado state obligation. And other states have similar types of obligations. So I, I know I somewhat cannibalized that topic, Pope, well, because you, 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 were, you were interested. I know we, we got to speak about what's going on in D.C., which I know yeah. you're licking your I'll chops. Contribute. I'll contribute to Colorado. The judge in her order dis- denying the motion to dismiss, setting the case for trial on Monday, had a footnote in her order which gave Donald Trump the way out. It's just not available to him. Donald Trump's ultimate argument is Congress can take away the disability related to the 14th Amendment and allow him to run for office. And she basically called his bluff in one of her footnotes, and she said, sure, you could do it now. Right now, Donald Trump, if you had the numbers in your favor, which he doesn't, if you can get two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate to take away the disability, even in advance of the trial on Monday, she said, I don't really want to do this case. She said in the beginning, there's some cases that judges really would rather not do. I have an obligation to do them. But if you think you can get 292 votes in the House, a House that the majority couldn't even get a speaker for about a month, and 67 votes in the Senate, we don't have to do this trial. Now, that was sort of a mean, <laughs> I was mean in a good way by the judge because Donald Trump knows he could never get 292 votes or 67 votes, two thirds in each house related to this. You know, the whole battle here between what I always see time and time again, I'm not sure who the lawyers are for Donald Trump in this one, but they're equally poor, whoever they are, because they're constantly um, doing unforced errors, telling the judge cases stand for propositions that they don't stand for, telling the judge that there's legislative history that supports them when it doesn't, telling the judge that there's law review articles by right-wing Federalist Society people who have changed their mind and have decided that Donald Trump was right all along, that, that only the Senate and the House can remove him and not a, um, not a, not a secretary of state of a state or a state. And that's wrong. And and it's it's just so easy for judges and their law clerks who help them do the research to to take the cases that Donald Trump cites and easily dispatch them as not being credible, reliable. That's the number one thing that kills a lawyer like you and me when you're an advocate in court, when you lose your credibility and when a judges can't trust a word you say not just Donald Trump here, but his lawyers in their filings about what things say and what things don't say. And the judge says, yeah, you're giving me all these constitutional statutes and electoral act law about the the Congress and their counting votes and who's allowed to be the president on certificates of election has nothing to do with the 14th Amendment and and whether it's self-actuating, meaning whether it has to go through an act of Congress or not. And it obviously, based on the history here, it doesn't have to go through an act of Congress, nor does it require a criminal finding, a trial finding that he was an insurrectionist or a rebellion against the United States. That's why he doesn't say convicted of a crime, convicted of the following. It's just that he did the following, and that's based on evidence. Now, I've seen the interview with the Secretary of State for Colorado, and she's very clear that she believes that Donald Trump should not be on the ballot and that he was part of the insurrection. And she's also called him out for not even attending his own trial on Monday when it, when it matters most, when the chips are down. But this trial, this bench trial, with all the weight of the evidence that's going to be presented on the scale 
And the scale here is not beyond a reasonable doubt. The scale here is preponderance of the evidence. All the evidence is going to go to the plaintiff's side that's trying to ban him from from the um, uh, ballot, from being on the ballot. And so based on the rulings that have already been made by this judge leading into the trial, although sometimes you can't use those totally as predictors because they're on individual issues, I think she's very open-minded. I think Trump's not going to present a shred of evidence. I think the other side is going to put on their evidence. And she's already, as a judge, crossed the Rubicon to decide that she can and has to, as a judge, decide this issue. It's not a political question that has to only be decided in Congress. It's something, once she crossed that barrier and declared off the motion to dismiss that was just filed, that she, as a judge in a black robe, can make the decision, now hearing the evidence, I would be shocked if she didn't conclude at the end of that week or whatever it's going to take that Donald Trump did commit rebellion and insurrection against the company and should be invalidated from being on that ballot. I mean, she actually said in her order on issues about, because they tried to handle it on a motion to dismiss the Trump side, uh, he's not, he didn't commit rebellion or insurrection. She said, that'll be left for trial. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was just like a chilling one-liner in her order. So, you know, a lot of these other ones got um, dismissed. People might be thinking, what about the one in Florida? What about the one in Michigan? A lot of them died because they got filed in federal court and federal judges were like, no, uh, we don't see this. We don't see standing. We don't want to take this case. That's fine. But this state court judge in Colorado with her secretary of state, you know, the as the person that uh, is going to be compelled to do something or not here, she's ready. And I would, I don't know about you, Ben, I'd be shocked if she doesn't, after hearing all the evidence, rule against Donald Trump and keep him off the ballot, meaning it'll have to go to the Colorado Supreme Court and maybe to the U.S. Supreme Court after that. And the timing of when I think it will go to the United States Supreme Court is interesting as we go to our next topic, which is the March 2024 federal trial in Washington, D.C. for Trump's attempt to overthrow the results of the 2020 election, because I am supremely confident that special counsel Jack Smith is going to secure a guilty verdict in that case. So as the Colorado case, which I also agree, Popak, I think the judge is going to find that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection and is disqualified. I think that ruling will be stayed pending the appeals process. And then at some point that appeals process, which we all know the wheels of justice take slightly longer than we would all like it to here on the Midas Touch Network, at some point that then intersects with the March 2024 federal trial in Washington, D.C., where a guilty verdict there cannot necessarily be brought in as new evidence in a trial that's already been completed in Colorado. But certainly on appeals, it would be a compelling thing to request the United States Supreme Court take judicial notice of that there was a guilty conviction in a federal prosecution of Trump's attempt to overthrow the results of a 2020 election. So as Popak and I think through these issues, as as experienced litigators and practitioners, we also think through not just what's happening today, but what's going to happen three, five, seven months down the road. And we want to impart that upon you as well. So you can start not just planning on what's happening next week, say with the Trump kids going uh, to testify, but what's going to happen in seven months, what's going to happen in nine months. And we try to give you the best data available for that. You also talked about Popak, Trump's lawyer's losing all credibility. And we see that happening in all of the cases and particularly prominent in Washington, D.C., where good lawyers become bad lawyers very quickly and become propagandists as they represent Donald Trump. I mean, someone like a John Lauro and a Todd Blanche, by all accounts, had good reputations of law as lawyers. But in order for them to represent Trump, they have to go full MAGA or they choose to go full MAGA. And then they just completely make no sense and lose all credibility. You know, when Trump makes them file motions and their lawyers, they have their bar numbers, so they have to willingly file these motions, trying to take his conspiracies and file them in federal court, where then special counsel Jack Smith has the framework of, okay, that's completely deranged. You have these documents you're whining about. Here's where they are. What are you talking about? And so then when a judge reads something like that, 
The next time those Trump lawyers try to make an argument, the judge knows they're just liars. You lose your credibility. You lose your ability as an advocate. I want to talk about Thor, that, about that, especially I want to talk about Mark Meadows uh, now being confirmed to have taken an immunity deal. We called that uh, before. Want to remind everybody as well. You see the impact of the reporting here at MidasTouch.com. You see Donald Trump and Trump Jr. attacking the Midas Touch editorial team. You see every week breaking news stories that's being broken by Midas Touch. And if you want to support that independent journalism, go to patreon.com slash Midas Touch, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Midas Touch. Get ready, folks, for a Popakian breakdown of all things Washington, D.C. federal prosecution after this quick. This is Michael Popak from Legal AF. If you're like me, you understand the pains of choosing what to wear. Let's face it, most clothes are uncomfortable or too tight or are never actually the size you really are. Not to mention the annoyance of trying to put a good outfit together. And when you do have a good fit, you can only wear it for a few hours before you have an important meeting or dinner. And then you got to change all over again. Everyone wants to dress the best and look good at all times because, frankly, it's a confidence booster. So here's the deal. Men's closets were due for a radical reinvention, and Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable, and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion with the commuter collection, which offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, one-quarter zips, and polos. You never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan commuter collection. Roan's comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy whatever life throws your way, from your commute to work to your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with its gold fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I absolutely love Roan. As you can see, this has truly become my go-to commuter fit and on the Legal AF podcast recordings. We're on the move a lot, whether it's jumping from meeting to meeting or catching a flight or an important dinner. The Roan commuter collection has never let me down. The versatility and comfort of the collection is undefeated. Even after I wear it all day, I still feel super fresh because of that Gold Fusion anti-odor technology. The commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash legal AF and use promo code legal AF to save 20% on your entire order. That's 20% on your entire order when you head to R-H-O-N-E slash legal AF, promo code legal AF. Find your corner office. Well, you definitely need that anti-odor protection when you start reporting on Donald Trump because things always smell very foul and foul indeed in the various cases, especially what's going on in Washington, D.C. I want to break down a lot or rather pass the proverbial legal AF football to Michael Popak because we've got Mark Meadows. Uh, being confirmed to have accepted an immunity deal based on all reports. Popak, you had called that when the indictment was unsealed. You have Judge Chutkin putting Donald Trump on the spot saying, you want this to be televised? Okay, just let me know in a minute order. You've got Donald Trump filing multiple frivolous motions to dismiss. You've got Trump trying to blackmail or gray mail the United States government with classified documents. And you've got um, Jack Smith just calling out how frivolous Trump's discovery motions are. I'll let you take the first big bite out of this legal AF apple. <laughs> the, thank you, Ben. The, um, the comments you made about the lawyers, though, reminds me of a very famous quote by John Dean in Watergate, the lawyer for Donald, for, uh, I was at Donald Trump, for Richard Nixon, who actually went to jail as well. In the 1973 Senate Watergate hearing, he said, quote, how in God's name could so many lawyers get involved in something like this? I'm talking about himself and others. Same thing here. I mean, you got all the lawyers, and there's still more to come in Georgia who have been indicted, yet have not yet pled. And then you've got the lawyers who are still currently representing Donald Trump but doing so really to do no great service to the legal profession, let alone to Donald Trump's side. A lot going on in D.C. You just outlined. We got Meadows, the 
uh, Chutkin about uh, Judge Chutkin about whether this is going to be televised. Those motions to dismiss the gag order and the classified documents. Let's start with Meadows. Meadows is very, very interesting, and we're trying to sort it out. And Karen and I, on the weekend, a midweek edition, we're trying to sort it out too about the mismatch that we've seen between him being indicted in Georgia not cooperating there, not even being an offer to plead deal and kicking and screaming, trying to take the case to federal court and, you know, Jack Smith saved me or whatever those motions were supposed to be all about. That all got denied. And then um, him, as we suspected, as soon as we saw the summer indictment of Donald Trump in August, we suspected that where was Mark Meadows? We looked through pages upon pages, allegations, hundreds of allegations in, in the four conspiracy counts against one defendant and Donald Trump before Judge Chuck. And we said, where's Meadows? I mean, there's not even things that sort of where we know he was present and it, they seem to be purposefully excised from the text of the uh, of the indictment. Why? And we could only conclude, as, as you and I did, that, that Meadows was cooperating in some way, shape or form. And now we know there was at least a limited cooperation, went through the chief judge of the uh, D.C. Circuit Court um, in grand juries. He was given Fifth Amendment privilege for the purposes of testifying before the grand jury. And there's also reporting that that um, Mark Meadows also at least met with the prosecutors two or three times related to his testimony and that he's testified or provided evidence already about the big lie and the big fix and Don- and the fact that he was one of the people telling Donald Trump that there was no outcome determinative fraud in the election at all, that um, that he was repulsed and told Donald Trump so when Donald Trump declared himself the victor on the night of the election before all of the other ballots were counted, including absentee ballots and the like, and military ballots. Um, and but we also know all the other things that Mark Meadows was involved with, which is really everything the gatekeeper in the White House involved with coordinating with the campaign of, of Trump to, to cling to power, coordinating the fake electors and making sure that they all got presented to Mike Pence, the pressure campaign against Mike Pence, the document movement from the White House to Mar-a-Lago and to, and to um, Bedminster. I mean, Mark, Mark Meadows, him burning documents in his own fireplace, according to his right-hand person, Cassidy Hutchinson. I mean, Mark Meadows has a lot of things that he can say, but yet he still, while he wasn't indicted and wasn't even listed as an unindicted co-conspirator, because there's six of those and none of those are named Mark Meadows in the Chutkin indictment and the Jack Smith indictment, we're like, well, but but what's going on? He, he got indicted in Georgia. How is He's not completely fully cooperating with Jack Smith. Is there still exposure there? The bad news for Donald Trump is that Mark Meadows, who he can't claim he doesn't know or doesn't remember, and can't claim as a liar because every other time he said Mark Meadows was a good guy, a courageous guy, a trustworthy guy. That's why he made him his chief of staff. Um, this is not a good thing in Trump world for Mark Meadows to be cooperating in any way, shape, and form with Jack Smith. The question is, is he also going to cooperate ultimately with Fawny Willis? Fawny has her little group of four cooperating witnesses, including three former Trump lawyers, which Jack Smith, I'm sure, is going to try to get over to his side to cooperate with him, or they're going to get indicted or convicted or uh, indicted. So you got that going on, but you got, she's got Meadows by the short hairs while Jack Smith is still trying to get him to, you know, to play well uh, inside the sandbox against, you know, and help him with his case in DC. So we're going to, but we have the confirmation now that he did testify. Um, the the uh, gag order issue is coming to a head. We're going to get a filing uh, right before we go on the airtime, probably from that'll complete the briefing about whether that gag order that she, Judge Chutkin, temporarily lifted for about two weeks, just long enough for Donald Trump to do more bad things that got used against him in real time in the filing by the Department of Justice. I mean, they filed things and put in there things that had happened earlier in the day in New York, including the violation of the gag order earlier in the week in the 60 Minutes Australia, Anthony Pratt, billionaire Australian who was secretly recorded uh, against Donald Trump, calling him a mobster uh, and uh, and a punk. Uh, all of those things ended up in the brief that was filed by the Department of Justice to encourage Judge Chutkin not just to reimpose her gag order to stop him from using violent rhetoric, targeting prosecutors and and witnesses, but to strengthen 
the conditions of his release from jail so that if he does it again and tries to attack Mark Meadows, which was also in the briefing by the by this uh, by the Department of Justice and he, or any other witness that he goes after that that she revoke the conditions and find that they've been violated of his release and therefore another pathway to jail for Donald Trump. So Donald Trump may have gotten some political uh, mileage for a couple of weeks, shaking his tambourine, trying to raise money by going back and calling Jack Smith a thug again and attacking people and violating the the gag order in New York. But the chickens are all coming home to roost now. And they're all being used as evidence against him to not only reimpose the gag order, but to make to to have another tripwire for him to maybe end up in um in jail. Uh, you want to take the uh, classified document issue, the the gray the gray mail. That's really interesting. Yeah, we've heard about black mail in court proceedings involving classified documents. We call it gray mail, where a criminal defendant tries to inject classified documents that they either stole or are aware of and says, well, if you continue to prosecute me, I'm going to have to talk about some classified information that could be very damaging to you, government, and very damaging to the American people. Look, court proceedings take place in public, right? And so at some point, what you have to deal with is balance the national security interest attendant to classified information. And a criminal defendant has constitutional rights and due process rights to get discovery material that may be relevant or exculpatory in the case. And so Donald Trump's making an argument, not in the Southern District of Florida case, obviously that one involves classified documents that Donald Trump stole, where he can engage in a lot of gray mail there. But in Washington, D.C., Donald Trump says, you know what we really need to talk about in this case that are going to be really important to my uh, defense. We need to really talk about America's uh, uh, international assessments about Russia and Iran and China and foreign government interference, which Donald Trump may have disagreed with his own intelligence community, because Donald Trump says he wants to make that a major part of his defense. And folks, It's a hard issue, I guess, to unpack, although I think I just did it fairly easily. But the egregious nature of this should be front page news. You hear it here on Legal AF, of course, but that's an actual motion that Donald Trump uh, brought. And he's using coded language a little bit. But if you know what he's trying to do here, it is obvious what he is saying by his disagreements with the intelligence community's assessment about election security. Our intelligence community believed that there were massive threats from Russia, from Iran, from Saudi Arabia, from China trying to interfere with our election and trying to basically help Donald Trump win. Donald Trump is saying his disagreement with that is somehow relevant relevant to his defense in Washington, D.C. It isn't. What he's really saying is for 2024, he wants our enemies to learn about those security assessments that were done by our intelligence community by trying to put that into evidence in his case and thereby gray mail the Department of Justice and government into being afraid to try this case publicly. Like how heinous is that? And that relates to a motion Donald Trump filed about challenging the SEPA Classified Information Procedures Act redactions and withholding of documents that special counsel Jack Smith has does not want to produce. And under SEPA, the Classified Information Procedures Act, special counsel Jack Smith's able to have an ex parte under seal and in camera uh, hearing with the judge without Trump basically be like, look, these documents are not important. They're not relevant and they're very dangerous if they're released. And Trump's arguing, nope, make them all available. Those are major parts of my defense. So you see the games Donald Trump's playing there. Judge Chutkin also made the brilliant move in a minute order saying, okay, Donald Trump, I hear you want this case to be public. That's what you're talking about uh, to the public. So here's the minute order. Defendants combine response, if any, to the media coalition's application for audiovisual access to criminal trial proceedings. 
And basically, she asks Donald Trump what his view is about the media's request to televise and make this trial available publicly. So putting Donald Trump on the spot here where Trump's going to have to respond if he wants this case to be televised. He says that in his speeches, but we know the propaganda from the speeches and the legacy media and the right wing propaganda machines pump out is different than what goes on in the case. And we've made it our mission here on Legal AF with this rapidly expanding legal AF community that you have all created to say, let's just talk about the facts. Let's talk about the evidence because facts and evidence and what's going on in the courtroom, you know what? That doesn't have a political party. We don't want to be lied to. We don't want to be played here at the legal AF community, at the Midas Mighty community, and in the American community. We don't, and across the world, we don't want to be played. So tell us the facts and show us what's actually going on in court. That is one of our main missions here. And also, one of the things special counsel Jack Smith pointed out as well is Donald Trump's lawyers made this like ridiculous motion where they wanted to subpoena the January 6th committee because they said that, the, which has been disbanded by Republicans, saying, they destroyed millions of records. Donald Trump put, posted on social media that the January 6th committee destroyed all, Donald Trump goes, destroyed all of its records and that therefore the case must be dismissed against it. First off, the records are available online. They're archived online. The Republicans shut down the uh, official government archive for it. So the archive had to be moved, but it's available online right now. There are certain documents which are not on that archive, which are highly sensitive confidential documents, but those were turned over when? Back in August by special counsel Jack Smith. Not only did special counsel Jack Smith turn those over, he put them in alphabetical order by witness. There was also other kind of like maps about where you can go to find these documents. He dummy proofed it for Trump's lawyers. And special counsel Jack Smith explained to the judge in Trump's conspiratorial laden motion filed by his lawyers, Jack Smith's like, okay, we don't know what he's talking about. We've turned over the, he has these records. He has all of the records. And then what Jack Smith pointed out is this footnote by Donald Trump's lawyers where they said, this is a good faith motion, but we have not reviewed all of the records. So special counsel Jack Smith goes, yeah, before you go and write a motion, maybe review the records. And by the way, special counsel Jack Smith says this also, if you didn't want to review your records, if that was too hard for you before you filed this thing, maybe give us a phone call and say, hey, is it in there? And then we would have told you where it is and we would have helped facilitate that. But no, you rather just file this complete bogus motion with the judge to tarnish the January 6th committee. You know, and this is where I always say to kind of, you know, the 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 MAGA Republicans, you know, people who are still MAGA, like you just must love being lied to. You just must love it. Like you must love being treated like crap and being treated so disrespectfully. Like it must give you joy to just be talked to and lied to all of the time because there are some things that are just so easy to disprove. Okay, really? He didn't get the documents? Well, here they are. They're right there. Now what? Oh, well, no, no, no. Okay, well, you can go down that rabbit hole of digging deeper and being further lied to through the depths of depravity. But we here at Legal AF and the Midas Mighty, we care about the truth first and foremost, beyond political allegiance and party. Tell me the facts tell me the evidence. Speaking of tell me the facts and tell me the evidence, Jenna Ellis, let's go to Georgia, Popak, in the criminal RICO case. Trump's lawyer, Jenna Ellis, yes, the Jenna Ellis, who got farted on by Rudy Giuliani in a fake hearing and then contracted COVID. And then I guess a common theme here, attacked Midas Touch back in 2020. She called us a D-list leftist something. I don't know what you call the D-list leftist. Uh, well, there you are, Jenna Ellis, with crocodile tears entering a guilty plea on a felony count in connection with the attempt to overthrow the election results in Georgia. In that guilty plea, she was crying and saying, I relied on some of the lawyers like Rudy Giuliani and smart lawyers, and I thought they wouldn't lead me into this. Wah, 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 wah. Michael Popak, tell us what went down in Georgia. And also, 
I got to love that Judge McAfee has a little bit of a sense of humor here by Donald Trump incorporating by reference motions. Trump's lawyers were too lazy, right, to bring their own motions to dismiss um, uh, on a lot of these occasions. So they incorporated by reference the motions to dismiss by co-defendants like Ken Chesbro and Sidney Powell and others and people who have pled guilty. So you've incorporated the re- by reference the legal arguments of guilty people. And Judge McAfee this week is like, okay, let's hold a hearing on that. Trump's lawyers, you can make the argument why the Chesbro motion and the Sidney Powell motion, which by the way, Popak, you called it, those motions blamed Trump. Like the incorporated by reference motions that attacked him. Bizarre. Oh, Tell us about as Georgia, if, Georgia, Georgia. It's almost as if they don't read the motions that they're they're asking the court that they'd like to adopt. Interestingly, for, for a location and a venue that probably poses the second greatest threat to Donald Trump going to jail, Georgia, he seems to take it the least seriously. Um, he has uh, one lawyer, literally one lawyer assigned to the case, Steve Sadow, who's his latest lawyer, having fired a set of lawyers when they didn't, they weren't able to get the indictment dismissed or the special purpose grand jury dismissed or the grand jury dismissed or Fawny Willis dismissed or anything else that they want. He fired them and he hired Steve Sadow. And we like, okay, Steve Sadow, he seems to have a reputation in Georgia, knows his way around a courtroom. He hasn't filed one piece of original thought or original writing since he's been a representing former President Trump. Um, not one. Uh, and so he's always doing me too. Oh, I like that set of motions. Not not anticipating that a number of those people like Trump's former lawyers or lawyers would eventually take guilty pleas and become felons and therefore totally discrediting the motion that you just adopted for your own. And so just to make sure that they're not going to be, if I were Steve Sato, I would have said, uh, I would draw my reliance on those motions and I would draft my own motion related to something related to Donald Trump, but they haven't really done that either. And so the judge is calling them out. And I love this judge for many, many reasons. One, he just refers to Trump as Trump. If we put that piece back up, it's just Trump. It's not former President Trump. It's not President Trump. I always say that Trump should be actually indicted for impersonating a federal officer because he keeps calling himself President Trump when he's at best former President Trump. But this judge just says Trump's motion, Trump's adoption, Trump's adoption, and all of that. Jenna Ellis is a weird cat. I don't know how to put this any better. 2016, she went on social media to totally trash Donald Trump. She said he's a criminal, a narcissist, a sleazeball, and his followers don't have any judgment whatsoever. That was 2016 Jenna Ellis. By the tw- time 2020 ran around and she needed, I guess, to, to support her law firm and she signed on for Team Crazy with Rudy Giuliani, it became she bought in completely. It became, you look at her social media then and to now, it was Donald Trump is a martyr. Donald Trump is a victim of the biggest heist, of, electoral heist in the history of America and everything else. And then full circle, right back, you know, 360 degrees. We're right back where we started. She's crying, as you as you noticed and mocked her, uh, rightly so, um, and blaming other older lawyers. Oh, it was the older white lawyer guys that led me astray. And then she almost named really Giuliani by, by name. Rudy Giuliani's got a big problem. The reporting that's coming out now is that while Fawny Willis is busy strategically flipping lower level people and people within Donald Trump's inner circle. She has no interest in providing a plea deal to somebody like Rudy Giuliani or Jeffrey Clark or maybe even Mark Meadows and John Eastman. And I've always predicted, and you can put it down on the Popak board, although my board is is, uh, decommissioned today, that the uh, final four of the trial um, it, it won't be March Madness. It'll be sometime after that, in uh, before November of 2024. To find a perfect final four for Do- for uh, Fonnie Willis to try her case would be sitting at one defense counsel table, one defendant's table, in front of one jury, presenting the evidence one time. Donald Trump, Meadows, if, unless she cuts a deal, Giuliani, Clark, and Eastman. If you were to pick the perfect group to try along with Donald Trump, it's this special breed of crazy. And to put them all together, because then it'll all bleed over. The crazy, the crazier that Clark is on the stand in front of a jury, if he takes the stand, 
um, the better it is for Fawny Willis. Same thing with Eastman. And one of these morons will take the stand to try to defend themselves. Probably not Mark Meadows, but the others. And so I think she's trying, she has visualized, you know, when you visualize things in life, you try to attain them. She has visualized a trial and that trial looks like that. And now she's going to flip people um, and give them uh, and felonies where she can, but get them to ultimately cooperate, make tearful apologies. They don't all have to make a speech like that. That was Jenna Ellis's decision to make a speech and dump on Rudy Giuliani and Ray Smith and some other lawyers that are still out there in the uh, in the indicted list. The um, the next thing I'm expecting, actually, I thought we'd be able to talk about it today. But maybe it took it'll take Fawny another week to process it. Is when does Fawny Willis file her motion to set the trial of Donald Trump? Now that now that the four or five month per- period that was reserved on the court docket with Judge McAfee for Sidney Powell and Ken Chesbro is off. There's a lot of free time on the calendar. Now she has to fit it between the March trial. I don't think she can go before March, but but the March trial of uh, Judge Chutkin and the May trial, maybe, maybe trial, I like to call it, of Judge Cannon in Mar-a-Lago. If Judge Cannon does what you think she's going to do, Ben, and get rid of May, I think Fawny's got her opening right there. Maybe she, maybe she buys that fight by scheduling in May and then puts Donald Trump on the horns of a dilemma because he really wants that May out there so he can use it to block and tackle the other cases. But he doesn't want that case out there because he doesn't want to try more than one case before the 2024 election criminally. He's got all these other civil cases that are going to trial and popping off in January and at different times. So if I'm Fawny Willis, I say, judge, we got an opening on the calendar. We're ready to go. We want to try the following group together. And she just declares it because he's looking, the judge is looking for Fawny to do the administrative work of figuring out which groups he's he said in the past, got to group these together. We'll, we'll probably do two or three trials. Tell me the groupings. She'll say, I'm ready for my grouping. I want it to be X date. I want it to be Trump, Giuliani, Clark, and Eastman, maybe Meadows. I want those five. And she'll say, well, I got room in a courtroom for that. And the lawyers related to that. Okay, what data are you proposing? And here's where she could really call Donald Trump's bluff and say, I want it after March, but before November, and pick a date that then puts her in conflict with Cannon and see what happens with Cannon. What do you think, Ben? Oh, Fawny Willis knows exactly what she's doing here because on November 1st, Judge Eileen Cannon's holding the hearing on Donald Trump's request to delay all of the dates in the Southern District of Florida, Mar-a-Lago theft of national defense secret case. Remember how Judge Cannons continued to delay and delay, then she said a hearing on the delay, and then a hearing now to delay everything. That's now scheduled for November 1st in Fort Pierce. So what Fawny Willis is doing is waiting to see what Judge Eileen Cannon is going to do at that hearing. The good news about Judge Eileen Cannon is her corruption is matched, in my view, by her incompetence because now Judge Eileen Cannon is kind of boxed in. And it's sometimes it's not what you do as a lawyer. Sometimes it's what you don't do also, which is equally powerful, right? So by Fulton County District Attorney Phony Willis not pushing for that trial date of Donald Trump yet, it now causes somebody like Judge Cannon who shoots from the hip and there's all these minute orders and her docket is so confusing to even, she's confused herself at this point. She rules on the request by the media to show up after a hearing takes place. Like she has no clue, like it's really incompetent stuff. But now Judge Cannon will see Donald Trump requested that the dates get moved in the classified document case, from you know which would move the May trial date. Phony Willis is going to watch exactly what happens on November 1st. And based on that, I would expect November 2nd, November 3rd, we're going to see Fulton County District Attorney Phony Willis issue a trial schedule. Which which has its own poetic justice, right? All of these dates, like the one that uh, Letitia James picked for the the trial testimony of Donald Trump, the date that you're just talking about, it's all on top of the election day 
date, which matters one year and one year away from the other election that really matters, which is 2024, election day this year. He's going to be testifying one day before the election day. You, She might be making the decision that you just perfectly outlined. Well, look, in and, that, and, in and that here's, the, here's the thing with MAGA too, as I always say, it's kind of fascism meets idiocracy, you know, with that incompetent dimension that exists in the movement as well, that we should all be very fortunate about. What I'm saying right now can't be used by Judge Cannon to help her. So don't worry. She's already screwed this up. So what I'm about to say, you can't be like, Ben, you're giving her the roadmap at this point. If she really wanted to be the one to help Donald Trump, which she clearly wants to, she would have set her trial date in March, like when Judge Chutkin did. And she would have done all of the things that a trial judge can do, let jurors on who don't belong on and kind of skewed it so that Donald Trump would get a hung jury or something like that. So Trump can run around and be like, see everybody, see, but because she's so incompetent and Trump's incompetent and also scared to go to trial, she thought she was doing Trump a solid by having this plan to incrementally delay the dates. But what that allowed was the DC case to take place in March. And now I think the Georgia case in Fulton County District Attorney Fawny Wells is watching that could potentially slide in for May, June right now. And then Trump, and this would be great for the nation. You have the two cases on Trump's attempt to overthrow the election take place before the November 2024 election. So Americans can see what a jury thinks about Donald Trump's conduct, both in state and federal court. We will, of course, keep you posted here on Legal AF. And again, you see the impact of Legal AF that's having nationally and internationally right now. You see the impact of MidasTouch.com breaking all these stories. So if you're able to now join Patreon for Midas Touch and help grow this independent media platform. Now would be a great time to do it. Go to patreon.com slash Midas Touch. You spell it P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash M-E-I-D-A-S T-O-U-C-H. When Don Jr. and Donald Trump are attacking your independent journalism, you must be doing something right. And when you're breaking stories that are resulting in contempt sanctions against Donald Trump, you must be doing something right. And when I say you, I'm referring to you, this incredible community here at Legal AF and the Midas Mighty, because this is more than just a network. This is a community. Once again, that's patreon.com slash Midas Touch, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Midas Touch. Thank you all to everybody who watches this. Make sure you're subscribed, not just on our uh, YouTube channel, which is free, by the way. You hit subscribe, but also make sure you are subscribed on audio. Just search for Legal AF on audio, wherever audio podcasts are available. And of course, go to store.midastouch.com and get that Legal AF merch. 100% union made, 100% made right here in the USA. Store.midastouch.com. Gear up with Legal AF merch right now. We'll see you next time on Legal AF. Thank you so much, Legal AFers. Michael Popak, always the best time of the weekend sharing this moment with you and all the Legal AFers. Have a great rest of your weekend. Have a great week. Justice is here. The wheels of justice turn and turn and turn, and we'll be here at each and every turn with all of you. Shout out to the Midas Midas.